84. We will start with the superscription, and that's that little piece above verse 1. A lot of these psalms have a superscription, some of which give us details that are helpful, and some of which are details that it's hard to really know exactly what they mean. There's a lot of head scratching, and, and, and a lot of these we've seen through the first 83 psalms over the last few years as we've worked our way through, and uh, we'll talk about the superscription tonight. So we'll start there, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get started. For the choir director on the Giddip, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you tonight. We thank you for these short words that we read, dear Lord. It's not much, but help us to understand and see what's going on, to understand what this superscription means, and kind of a little bit of background, dear Lord, about what got us to where we are. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to us as we seek your word and try to learn tonight. I pray that you just would help us to hear what we need to hear. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. So we're not actually going to dig into all the verses tonight. We're just going to look at the, at the superscription there and what it says and kind of break a little bit of that down. Now, we see here for the choir director, uh, a lot of these psalms would have, would have been put to music, uh, just like what we just sang. We, we put these words together, and a lot of the words that we sing are words from scriptures, and we put them to music, and we have a choir director that leads us and that's what we see here in this psalm. This would have likely been something that would have been sung. Uh, it says, on the giddeth, or on the gath, perhaps some of your translations say. Uh, that's some type of musical instrument. It's uncertain exactly what that is, but it's talking that this is a psalm that's to be sung. It's to be sung with a specific type of instrument that's going to accompany it. Accompany it. And it says, a psalm of the sons of Korah, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time, because when we go through the Psalms, we've already looked at a few of the songs of the sons of Korah, but we haven't really talked about the sons of Korah. Now, there are 11 throughout the 150 Psalms in our Bible. There are 11 that are attributed to the sons of Korah, or that speak of the sons of Korah. And so, tonight, we are going to get a little history lesson, a little background in who are the sons of Korah, and their story uh, is quite interesting. Now, we will see starting here in uh, Psalm 84, and then for the next few that we read, uh, most of the ones that we're going to look at over the next couple of months are all going to be Psalms of the sons of Korah. So who are the sons of Korah? Well, this takes us back to the book of Numbers. Now, if you want some homework this week, you can jot these passages down and, and look at them, in particularly Numbers chapter 16. We're not going to break it all down verse by verse, but I would encourage you to read it. But our story for the sons of Korah begins in Numbers chapter 3, verses 29 and through 31. The clans of the Kohathite camped on the south side of the tabernacle. And the leader of the family of the Koahite clans was Elizaphan, son of Uzael. Their duties involved the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the sanctuary utensils, utensils that were used with these, and the screen, and all the work relating to them. Okay, so we're talking here about the Kohathites. Now, they were from the tribe of Levi. Now, in the Old Testament, the tribe of Levi was the tribe that was where the priests came from. And they did all the work that had to do with the tabernacle. So there was Aaron and that priestly line, and the high priest would come from them, and they would do the priestly work. But other Levite groups, other families among the Levites, would have other jobs that they, were, they would do. And one of those families, we could look at, at, at two different uh, other ones, but tonight we're only going to look at the Kohathites. And they had some responsibilities too. And it tells us here in these verses what their responsibilities were in verse 31. The duties involved, the ark, okay, so the ark of the covenant, that's a pretty big deal. The table, the lampstand, the altars, the sanctuary utensils that were used with these, and the screen or the, or the, or the curtain, uh, 
and all the work relating to them. Okay, so that's what this particular group, the Kohathites, this is what their job was. When it came to the tabernacle, you get a good description of that in the Old Testament. It was like a tent, and it had these walls that surrounded it, and it was very specific, the instructions that God gave to the people on how to make it. And there was an outer room, and there was the Holy of Holies, and there were all these things that they had to do. And so different groups of families from the Levites were in charge of different things. And the Kohathites, here in Numbers chapter 3, verses 29 through 31, the Kohathites were in charge of these particular things. Let's look at Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. Aaron and his sons are to finish covering the holy objects and all their equipment whenever the camp is on the move. The Kohathites will come and carry them. But they are not to touch the holy objects, or they will die. These are the transportation duties of the Kohathites regarding the tent of meeting. So again, we're carrying on with their duties. Okay, so we established that the Kohathites are of Levi, and they have a specific duty when it comes to setting up the tent and taking down the tent. Now when it comes to taking down the tent and moving these things, now this was a tent that the Israelites, it moved along with them. So they would move and they would set up camp and then they would take it down. And during that time, God would dwell among them in the Holy of Holies as his people were working their way through the wilderness into the promised land. And so all of these different people had different jobs to do and the Kohathites were to deal with these things that we looked at in the last few verses. But they had to deal with these things very carefully. These were things that they could not touch or they would die, the Scripture says. And so it was the job of some to wrap all of these things that the Kohathites were in charge of. They had to be wrapped very well, and they had to be carried by hand. These things were of extreme significance, of, very important, of a lot of importance. They were very holy before God, and so... The Kohathites had a big responsibility. After all, the Ark of the Covenant was their responsibility. That's a pretty big deal in the Old Testament. And so we see these things, and, and, and please do go back and read and learn more about what some of the other groups had to do and their responsibilities were. But we see all of these things spelled out for us very clearly. So the Kohathites were important, and they had a very important task. And so this is our starting point to help us to figure out the, who was Korah and who are the sons of Korah. Well, we see that as we continue to read in Numbers chapter 16. Now, you may want to read this this week. It's a, it's a lot that goes on in this chapter, some pretty gnarly stuff, and we'll briefly talk about it. But in Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now Korah, okay, this is the name we're looking for, son of Ishar, son of Kohath, son of Levi. Okay, so here's our connection to Korah. Korah was a descendant of Kohath, who was a descendant of Levi. And so we're starting to, we're starting to understand who Korah is, but we need to understand all of the background of Korah and the Kohathites to kind of see how all this is playing out as the story unfolds. And so Korah is a descendant of Kohath. And the Kohathites are the ones that we just talked about in the previous verses. Okay, so here we have Korah, and it says in number 16, verse 1, that he was with Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, son of Reuben. Okay, so here we see these three characters. We have Korah, we have Dathan, and we have Abiram. Now, I'm going to summarize Numbers chapter 16 for you very loosely, but I encourage you to read it because it's good. So these three cats decided they weren't happy with how Moses was doing things, and they called Moses out, and they said, look here, you're putting all these rules and making us do all these things and have these commands and leading us in this way, and we're out here in the middle of the wilderness, and they said, look, all these people are good. We're all good. We don't need you. We don't need your way of doing things. Essentially saying, who put you in charge? Now they called Moses out and they called God out essentially by causing, calling Moses out. And when Moses heard this, he fell on his face. Now perhaps Moses was taking it to heart. Maybe he was checking himself saying, oh dear, I hope I haven't been doing wrong. I hope I haven't been leading wrong. Maybe he fell on his face because he knew that something was about to happen. Because here are these guys 
And the scripture says that they got 200 other 50, 250 other folks that's teamed up with them, and they are questioning Moses, who God has sent to lead them, and essentially saying, we don't need you. We can do a better job. We can do it by ourselves. Now, God was not pleased about this. And Moses said, okay, here's the deal. If these guys live their life, live a normal life, and die at an old age, then you will know that the charges they brought against me were right, that they have not spoken wrong in the things that they have said. But if the things that they have said are not true, then may the ground open up and swallow them. And when Moses got the words out of his mouth, here was Korah and the two with him, and the ground split open and swallowed them up. Now, God wanted to get rid of all of them, and Moses said, hold up, hold up, hold up. Don't, don't destroy all of them just because a few of them are disobedient. And so God said, you better tell everybody else to get back. And he told them, and they got back out the way. And that ground split open, and Korah and those with him, were they were sucked down into the ground alive. And so God was not happy with the way that they were doing things. And so here we are introduced to Korah. Now, Korah doesn't sound like a very good guy. Why in the world are the sons of Korah mentioned in Psalms if this guy was disobedient, questioned Moses, questioned God, and, got, and then the ground split open and sucked him down in it? Well, Korah was not a very good guy. And even though Korah and those with him and some of their family were destroyed along with them, it appears in the scripture, it's not true for all of Korah's family. Because we see in Numbers chapter 26 verse 11, the sons of Korah, however, did not die. Okay, so there were some descendants. Korah was a bad dude. He did not do right in the eyes of the Lord and he was gone. That was it. It was quick. It was done. It was over. But Korah still had some descendants. He still had some sons. And so the line of the sons of Korah continued on for generation after generation after generation after generation until finally we get to somebody's name that we know from the line of Korah. In 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 31 through 34, it says this, these are the men David put in charge of the music in the Lord's temple after the ark came to rest there. Now, we're a long way in the future now. We are up to the time of David. We were right there in the time of Moses. Korah died. His sons and descendants continued to live for years and years and years. We've gone hundreds of years now. We're a long way away from where Korah is first mentioned. But here his descendants are with David in these verses that we see. And David put them in charge of the music. All right, this is what we see in Psalms, that these are songs that are to be sang. These are words for a choir director. These are instructions for the instruments to use. These are songs of the sons of Korah. And here we see the connection between David and between the sons of Korah and that they were put in charge of music in the Lord's temple after the ark came to rest there. They ministered with song in the front of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, until Solomon built the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. And they performed their task according to the regulations given to them. Now, presumably, these are the same uh, uh, regulations that were given to them in Numbers chapter 3. Okay, so even though Korah didn't represent what the Kohathites should have done, his descendants obviously had either learned from his mistakes or, or maybe had never even gone down that track. Maybe they just said from the get-go, that dude is nuts. We don't want to have anything to do with him. But here, at least, we have these sons of Korah that appear to be doing the things that God has called them to do in whatever way that they may have looked like. Verse 33, these are the men who served with their sons from the Kohathites. Heman, the singer, son of Joel, son of Samuel, son of Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Eliel, son of Toah. Now, there's one name in there that we definitely know, and that is Samuel. So all the way from Kohath, the Kohathites, Korah, the descendants of Korah, lead us to the time of Samuel. Now, Samuel was certainly faithful to the Lord. And you can see uh, a similar list here of this genealogy when you flip over and you read the story of Samuel as well. And so this kind of gets us to a little bit of understanding at least. So when we read these superscriptions in the book of Psalms, 
Some of them, we don't understand what they mean whatsoever. But some of them, if we kind of dig into some of the words or some of the names there, we may discover that there is a great story for there. There's a, there's a great background there for us to, to dig into. And so here we have a good example of what not to do in Korah and the way that he lived his life and the way that he questioned God and the way that he was disobedient to God. But yet you have the sons of Korah that were obedient to God, that were faithful to what God had called them to do. So what about you and I? Are we more like Korah? Are we more like those that God speaks to us, that God tries to lead us, and we question what God does, and we're disobedient to what God does, and we don't want to hear or follow what God does? Or are we those that read the Word of God and say, okay, Lord, this is what you've called me to. Now, he hasn't called us to, to, to meticulously wrap and carry the Ark of the Covenant or any of the utensils of the tabernacle, but yet God calls us to do many things. And it's clear through these Psalms that are attributed to the sons of Korah that these descendants remained faithful, and they continued to do the work that God had called them to do, even though Korah himself was not a faithful servant. And so when we look at the songs, uh, the psalms that are attributed to the sons of Korah, there are quite a few that you know that you probably don't even know that you know. Some of the, some of the uh, psalms that may come to mind that you hear or may even say, you may not even realize that they are from the sons of Korah. One example is Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer longs for the streams of water... So I long for you. Anybody ever heard that before? Have we ever sung that in a song before? Yeah, we sing that all the time. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. That's the psalm of the sons of Korah. So we can remember that next time we sing that song. Uh, psalm chapter 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Anybody ever heard that one before? Yep, we've heard that one before. Another one of the psalms of the sons of Korah. Psalm chapter 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Well, that's a verse that I use a lot. I think about that verse, and I quote that verse a lot. Or some of your translations will say, He's an ever-present help in a time of trouble. You may know it that way, depending on your translation. Psalm 84, 10. We're going to get here probably next week or the week after. But what does it say? Better a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. That's a passage you've probably heard before. Uh, maybe if you're a basketball player, you look, you look at that passage. I used to have a buddy of mine in seminary, and he said, you know there's going to be basketball in heaven. Your Bible says so. I said, really? He said, yes, yeah, Psalm 8410. It says God has courts. He must be talking about basketball courts. Well, I don't think it's talking about basketball courts. But the point is, better is one day in the presence of the Lord than an eternity anywhere else. And so the Psalms of the sons of Korah are good for us. There's lots of good stuff in there for us to think about. And now we have a little bit of background of the faithfulness of the sons of Korah and of the unfaithfulness of Korah himself. So let us be those who are not unfaithful and disobedient, but let us be those who are faithful to what God calls us to. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We thank you for this little history lesson you give us tonight, and I pray that you just would help us to learn from what we see from back in the story of, of Korah. God, I pray that we'd look at Numbers chapter 16 and study it. Dear Lord, there's a lot of good stuff in there for us to consider. We see even in the midst of, of, the, of the destruction of those who were disobedient, we still see your grace on all the rest of them, dear Lord. We see, we see the love and the mercy of Moses and Aaron, dear Lord, and the way that they intervene there when all that goes on. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to learn from that. God, that we would not be like Korah, but we would be like those descendants of Korah, those sons of Korah, dear Lord. Let us, let us soak up these words that we see of theirs in the Psalms, the ones that we perhaps are aware of and know, and maybe some that we don't quite know yet, but maybe we will know them in the weeks to come. And I pray that all these things would lead us to Jesus Christ, dear Lord, that they would remind us that, dear Lord, you can take really bad things, and you can bring good things about in a time to come. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.